Moving on to the first step here, I've got some opaque black with a little bit of phthalo green in it uh, to give me just kind of a dark tone. Uh, the phthalo green will actually suspend some of the uh, opacity or the opaqueness of the black and uh, give it a little bit more color depth um, as opposed to just using black. So um, I'm going to come in here in these corner areas first and uh, nail down all the dark areas just to kind of bring the eye in and then we'll get started on the uh, flush tones. So I'm keeping my airbrush straight on as much as possible, especially since I'm trying to teach here. And that's about enough of the black color for that area. You can be pretty free with this at this point. You don't get too fuzzy. But we're actually just wanting to set this up and establish our darkest tones. I hit this with some heat here. Remember, canvas is slippery. We have to make sure we uh, let the paint uh, actually mesh to this surface here. Okay, I'm going to come in here with some masking tape and just uh, crop off uh, this edge of her leg. Now, good composition is usually a product of soft and hard edges. A lot of people in the beginning stages of this get too nutty um, with the edges and I've definitely learned over the years that you've got to uh, balance it all out. There's a lot of hard edges and there's a lot of soft edges. Then I'll come in with a bigger piece of tape here and protect my overspray from crawling. Now, even though I will be cutting on this canvas, um, I'm doing this just to try to minimize as much as possible, as much cutting as I can. I'm building a tape wall, as we always do. I have cut into canvas up to 30 times in one area without puncturing the canvas. extend this edge down where the uh, leg um, bends down here with a separate piece of tape. I just didn't want to crisscross at this point. I'm going to put my tape down. And I had said on my electroscall video that you will definitely be able to see through these uh, pieces of tape where your pencil lines are. And again, the trick to cutting on canvas without puncturing this is just common sense. Uh, do not use a dull blade. And I'm going to put the second piece down here. Try not to overlap your tape too much because then you're definitely going to be digging into the canvas at uh, more pressure with the blade and that could puncture the canvas. Remember X-Acto knife blades are more effective at a 45 degree angle. Little tape wall. And since I had some glue under here from the tape, I've taken some Goo Gone and some blue Walmart shop towel just to get any of the uh, glue off the surface here. And just kind of shade this out. composition here so I trace everything I can and um, really subtle shadow edges and so on and so on I definitely uh, trace those too
Okay, so I'm crawling around certain areas of the image here. This forearm and the edge of this forearm is going to be totally different than areas like this. This is what I would call a more acute edge, and this is going to be a softer edge. Again, sometimes uh, people will just grab uh, a bird shield or a French curve and just totally blast that out. But again, this is something where you really need to zoom in on your photograph and uh, really try to diagnose which edges are hard and which are soft. In this area over here, I do have a pretty crisp edge. So that's probably an edge where a template would be necessary uh, to give me a little bit more balance in this because uh, that's just the way the uh, subject was photographed. So uh, if you look at the uh, photo reference I'm showing on the screen here, in this area of the uh, elbow is definitely a more acute edge. Again, maybe not as stark as this one or as crisp as this one, but it's definitely a lot crisper than the side of this elbow over here. Okay, with the tape still on here, uh, I've left it on here because the overspray is definitely flying around. And I want to make sure that uh, I bend this back up. If your hand has hit it, to catch the overspray. That's what tape walls are for. But I'm going to put a little bit of an edge down here. We're actually just kind of wisping down. We're not doing any crylining stuff because, again, we don't want barbells and patches everywhere. That should be pretty good to set up that area. Again, I'm going to be coming in here with some flush tones to transition these other colors, but this at least gives me kind of like a little uh, road map to work on here. And down here, I'm going to blend that out now a little bit. Here you can see that when you have edge acuity against real soft things that are going on in other areas of the piece, uh, the uh, contrast really starts to pop, and especially when you work really big like this. Okay, and on the next part of this, just like on the Electra Skull video, I went ahead and put a black line uh, to reference exactly where I have cut. Now, this tape is almost white. Uh, on a white surface so it would be really hard to see where I'm actually spraying. Now again, when you're blasting big areas like this, definitely make sure that you have an adequate tape wall uh, to protect the avoided lighter areas of the overspray here. When I 
get down here, I want to just establish where the uh, shadow starts and the object starts. This is really just serving as a guide for now. I'm trying not to totally meet the edge here. Okay, my air pressure is about 53 to 55 PSI. I'm going to come in here and nail down this uh, uh, area above the shoulder here, just kind of blacking that out. So I have this all darkened out here, and it's really uh, bringing the eye in towards the uh, contrasting elements of this piece here. But I'm going to have to do a lot of uh, uh, value assignment with the uh, shading and how it uh, tapers and fades and uh, these little areas here. There's going to be a lot of freehanding inside the middle part here underneath her jawline. Feather that out, fade it out. Again, I wouldn't call this real intense shading at this point. We're really just trying to establish edges and contours um, that will help us as we crawl inside the image here. This just kind of pleases the eye to not have to drift out. Um, but again, all the freehanding is going to be done on the inside of this image here. Bring this down a little bit here. almost like a foreshortened uh, type of curvy concept. So I want to make sure that I don't get too much overspray in that area to just stay true to where my pencil line was because this kind of tapers in a weird uh, three-dimensional way here. Okay, coming in around this neck area here, I got to make sure I definitely do not overemphasize this jawline here because it's very hard to come back in with white and try to fix things. Um, as we all know, or hopefully you know, the white sets off a, a titanium shift. You get this kind of muddy, bluish look. So um, you can do it, you can pull it off, but it uh, just takes a lot of time to uh, come in and blend that back out. back. I'm just going to do light little whisks 
and then I will blend my flesh tone, light brown, dark brown, and all that into that. I'm really just working in little islands right now. staying true to what I see in the photo reference. Okay, on this jawline area, I'm actually not going to make this a real crisp edge like I've done down here. I'm going to preface where I'm going to lay this French curve at. And basically what I'm going to do, I like using French curves for uh, softer edges. Again, the uh, templates um, that you either buy or make or whatever uh, are a lot thinner in their mill, so they're going to give you a crisper edge. You want to use uh, French curves for softer edges here. And I'm even holding my knuckles um, off the surface here, so I can just give an indication as a breaking edge there. Don't want to be too dominant with that. And then try to keep the airbrush straight on. Again, it's always hard for me to do that when I teach, but now is the time where I definitely do not want overspray crawling up into the facial area. Notice how I'm just doing little wisping strokes to prevent cryloning the airbrush, waving it back and forth, and so on. So that really just sets up a nice little soft edge here. You really have to assign the intensity of these edges. But for the most part, this is all a pretty dark area. I'm not going to uh, overthink this. It's really just uh, almost totally black. So I'll continue filling this in here. Okay, so the base of this hand has a subliminal edge um, that's not as crisp as this is, it's not as soft as this is, but it's about somewhere in between. So hopefully this is making sense, I'm uh, creating different values of edges here. But I want to crop the base of this hand here, wipe the uh, paint off on your arm or your cloth or whatever. And then here's the move, I'm going to take this, it starts there, but we're going to take it turn it, and sculpt that hand out lightly. Now there's going to be more shading at the base of the wrist here, but I'm not going to come in with this black color. Now the flesh tones are all going to be a lighter to darker color. But uh, really this is just establishing the islands and the contours of the anatomy here. Now there's another area over here um, under the neck where the neck and the hand meet. I'm going to take my knuckles and put an edge right about here, but again, not too crisp. And as you can see, that creates a breaking point where this uh, wrist and hand start to kind of uh, protrude back. And I'll do another edge right here. And as you can see, the edge I just did there separates the arm or the hand from the background, but not as extreme as these edges are here. And that's what a good composition is, variables and uh, contrasting elements. Okay, even though I've been putting the uh, black down first, I'm not going to do it on the face because uh, the face it's going to have the black inside on top of the flesh tone. Every other black that I've sprayed here has uh, been around the perimeter of the flesh tone base. So what I'm going to do is come in and start setting up the flesh tone areas. Um, they're going to be an opaque, powdery, foundational base coat flesh tone. Uh, you can mix your flesh tone however you want. You can see on my hand, um, flesh tone is a very powdery color uh, with hints of this and that, depending on the intensity of the light and so on. But for right now, I'm going to powder puff this thing out, what I call powder puffing the face, the arms, the legs, the flesh tone, and start transitioning my colors 
um, with light and dark brown. And it will actually give this some roll around and some form and uh, start making them uh, look more believable. Then I will come in with these uh, darker areas uh, like the black around the eyes where they break and uh, resend back. Okay, so what we're going to do next is come in here and put the tape down on our edge. We're going to cut inside the perimeter and uh, protect the black area. We don't want uh, flesh tone powder puffing this out. In certain areas, it's not going to matter because we're going to have complementary uh, transitioning tones like light and dark brown. But on the uh, perimeter here, this concise edge, I want to keep that. And we'll just sculpt our way around here. And I will start by cutting. Cut outside the color here so that you don't get what's called a white line when you expose the uh, surface here. Okay, and then with my uh, goo gone here, uh, since I lifted a piece of tape um, off of the canvas, I guarantee you there's uh, some adherence um, that's on top of this white surface. I'll just lightly wipe off the glue or any contaminants. You just want to get this tacky. Okay, and coming in with this flesh tone, since I had black in the airbrush, I definitely want to make sure that um, it was cleaned out thoroughly. Um, this opaque flesh tone would show black uh, very quickly. So I'm just going to come in here. I always do a squirt or two, uh, just kind of get any uh, pre-existing water that was resonating around the guts of this airbrush, or even cleaner. I just want to come in here and work lightly and evenly. Now again, the whole purpose of this flesh tone is really just to set up a powder puff. I always tell people metaphorically, it's like when a woman's putting on her makeup and she goes puff on each side of her cheeks. That's what we're doing here. This is just a, a foundational tone here. The uh, browns, the light and dark brown will actually uh, transition the colors to blend in with this black. So when I get up in the uh, blended type of areas here, that's where the manipulation takes place. The uh, Chiaro Squirrel concept. And we'll just continue along here. Work lightly and evenly. You can use whatever kind of uh, flesh tone you want. Okay, now this next step is kind of cool because I can actually uh, show people the whole sequence to uh, loose and contact masking here. This is going to be real uh, helpful. I do not uh, need to leave this tape on here anymore uh, because the tape is really just to try to control uh, the opacity or the uh, powderiness of this flesh tone here. So I can go ahead and take this off. And because I'm working with transparent colors here, um, I already have a, an opaque edge established. Uh, that's what transparent colors can do for you, is that once you establish an opaque foundation, which is a, again a chalky, powdery foundation, you can come in here with the transparents and kind of uh, transition these uh, contours around here. Okay, the next color is going to be a Createx light brown here. Now if you take this color and just start prefacing where you're going to lay the shields, the templates, and really just blending this black into the uh, flesh tone here. Now, I was actually taught my flesh tone formula by a janitor. His name was uh, Jeffrey Goodnight a long time ago. I give him a lot of credit to everything I know. Uh, he had a real basic formula, which is a uh, flesh tone, then light brown, you pierce with dark brown, and then you tint with transparent red or yellow. Uh, and again, the flesh tone can be the opaque base, all those other colors I added on top of that were the transparents. So I can take this light brown and just come in here and start setting up all the uh, features of the face here. There's not a lot to this. I'm going to get away with a lot of uh, edge manipulation just because of how the image was uh, photographed. But I want to make sure that I pay attention to what I see here. Here's a cool part of the whole Kiara Scuro thing. Here's my transparent brown. I can lay it right on top of this crisp edge here. And again, this transparent paint's gonna be kind of wet. So I need to you know let it catch up with the surface, let it dry, 
But if I keep coming in here and emphasizing it, it will give me a nice little roll around here. And I can set it up with brown. And I would probably come in with a uh, paintbrush to refine that a little bit. Now where the jawline is, I can start feathering this out now. Now these are little wisps here. This is what I'm talking about. You don't want a Krylon. The dark brown that I put on top of this will actually help me blend this out a little bit more here. And we have an indication of the crease of the eye, which is going to be right here. This is a pretty intense shadow. And the eyebrow is going to be up in here. I'm going to take my template and I can start isolating edges on the eye here. There's one. I'm going to wipe off the paint. And again, it doesn't have to be real, real defined. I have my knuckles underneath this. There's two. So that kind of gives me an indication of an edge there. I take my light brown and start blending some of this out. And start setting up the nose here. Notice again how I'm working in little wisps. Now this area over here is what I would call the lazy edge. A lot of times uh, people will get nuts and just put tone all over uh, the perimeter here of this edge. You definitely do not want to do that. Uh, you want to keep some of these edges void and kind of sneaky and use some hit and miss tone over here. And I have a shadow uh, near the uh, cheekbone here. I gotta be real careful with this and not overemphasize it. One thing I like to do when I'm rendering shadows on the face is actually do it real lightly like so and then look away, go look at something like a wood grain pattern or something to dissociate the intensity of what you've just sprayed. Then about 30 seconds later, I'll look back at it and see if I need to apply more paint and get darker. And we'll put some brown back here. This lip area here for the most part is about a quarter tone. In uh, previous videos I've talked about full tone, half tone, quarter tone, and nothing. The avoided areas, this would be pretty much avoided area right in here that I'm not going to mess with too much that becomes the highlight, that becomes the contour. Uh, around the lip here, this is a pretty light area as this is. This is what I would designate as a quarter tone. Of course, this dark area is a full tone. Little edge there. The under part of the nose is gonna blend in. Okay, I looked away and I see that her uh, cheekbone area here needs a little bit more tone on it. Don't forget to just do wisps. The funnest part about working in chiaroscuro like we're doing here is that we can actually bring the dark brown in and it actually really transitions the black and light brown together nicely, but it also almost becomes like a black type of a piercing color. So when you airbrush just these three colors here, flesh tone, light brown, and dark brown against black, you get this really smooth, soft look that you could uh, perhaps put crackle medium on if you're doing religious type of imagery or whatever. That's what I'm a big fan of doing. So uh, coming in here uh, with these eyes uh, with the dark brown, from a distance, this is going to look pretty dramatic. Uh, the dark brown will also be used to uh, trim the uh, nose here. I don't want it to look like the Wicked Witch. I have some trimming to do, but I'll probably do that with dark brown because it gets so dark so quick. Now down by the mouth here, this is what I consider to be like a quarter tone. The dark brown is going to really define 
the under part of the lips here, which I'll uh, spray a little bit of red. Um, but this is uh, pretty much an underpainting type concept. I'm layering these colors here. A lot of light brown up here. And I'll blend the jawline in a little more here. Light brown around the eye here. So this would be pretty much the voided areas I would leave alone here. So my dark brown, I'm going to come in here and knock down some of these uh, edges a little bit. One of the things I really want to emphasize here is how you don't totally blast out all these edges. You pay attention to your photo reference and you're bringing some of the tone in uh, depending on the uh, object, but you're not totally just blasting out all of these edges. The eyebrow is kind of a weird shape. It's going to be up here. And kind of mix in with this hair strand here. But the upper crease of the eye is about right here. So I'm going to knuckle my shield. Just put an indication of a crease right there. And start filling some of this in. Now, this is the area that's going to be blackened, but uh, this uh, hopefully proves. Well, I don't want to come in here with black uh, at the beginning because I've used really a, a powdery flush tone. I can sneak the black in at the end here. But what I'm going to do is take this dark brown as far as it will go until I need the black. And there's another little weird shadow right here. I'm going to put my finger underneath the template and just put an indication of a cropped shadow. And there's some tone down here by the lip. And you can see how the uh, dark brown starts to punch some of these areas out here. And again, I'm going to bring some heat in now with my dark brown. This dark brown gets pretty uh, dark, and uh, you don't need uh, too much black floating around inside of this here. And that's a good balance with some of this fuzzy stuff that I did. Let's go ahead and do the upper eye crease. I think I'll hold the template this way. tiny little wisps when I did that. Okay, I'm going to take my paintbrush and come in here and put some eyelashes in here. Don't get too carried away with this. You just want to break some of this fuzziness up a little bit. Some of them are going this way. And fuzz over those a little bit. And that kind of retains a more feminine look here. I'm going to push the uh, forehead back a little bit. And I'll come in with some uh, Createx transparent red around the bottom part of the lip here that we do see. Okay, now this is the point where I said I was going to come in with a little bit of black here, but not that much. I'll get back to the lip uh, and the detail shading. I'm just going to come in here with a tiny bit of black. Again, I did take my dark brown as far as it could go, but you uh, definitely see a difference between the dark brown and the black here. This is a good example. I actually had to come back on the mouth and uh, crop some of that back. I took some opaque white and then some flesh tone and I knocked that back a little bit. I actually had a frowny face kind of thing going on here, but you can see how I've restored it. Uh, what I'm going to do next is come in here uh, with some deep red and just accent the top part of this lip here a little bit. A lot of this uh, chiaroscuro imagery 
depending on the photo reference you have, you may not see a lot of detail, so you're going to be forced to uh, superimpose uh, some of the little nuances and the uh, color patterns here. And this deep red really gets dark. It's a beautiful color. Okay, crawling down the image here, I'm going to be taking my uh, masking tape and protecting my black area now on this side and over here on the shoulder. And base coat this thing with flesh tone and basically crawl down the image here and start finishing this thing off. Again, when you put tape on here, you want to make sure that you don't cut too hard. You want to keep your blade really, really sharp uh, so that you do not puncture the canvas. And again, if you have a sharp blade, I've been known to cut into this canvas uh, up to 30 times and I still will not puncture the surface. Now I am going to start cutting this out, but notice when I come down here by the elbow area, uh, there's going to be a lot of freehanding. So uh, again, this is called sequential masking. You're actually knowing what to mask and what not to mask. And again, hopefully you're catching on to where the tape just establishes the crisp edges and these crisp edges taper into a lot of intense shading. Okay, moving along up in this area here, uh, there's not going to be any tape wall built because this is just a lot of uh, freehanding. I will uh, make sure I control my overspray when I freehand the flesh tone. Okay, I have my uh, tape walls built here. I got one here and some over here. But notice in this area there's no tape wall because uh, there's not a lot of crisp edges in this area. I'm just going to come in, do a lot of freehanding with the flush tone, make sure I don't get it all over the place, but I try to control that as much as possible in this area. Um, so what I'm going to do next is powder this area out, the middle, the belly, and over here on the shoulder, and then I will come in with the same sequence of shading with the light brown and the dark brown. Believe it or not, there's a lot of masking on the canvas as long as you keep the uh, surface sterile. Um, it's a, very similar to a car hood or something, but uh, people are quite surprised at the amount of masking you can do when you're doing fine art like this. Okay, before I go into the uh, belly area here, I'm going to go ahead and bust out the tape uh, to protect my crisp edges here on the legs. And with this covered, we'll go ahead and uh, start base coating the tummy out here. Again, I want to try to just get the area that I need to get. I do not uh, start crawling into the black areas here. So I'll try to keep my airbrush as straight as I can. Now on canvas, again, you got to keep the paint warm as you spray it because uh, even though tape is pretty uh, uh, bleed proof for the most part, uh, you will have uh, certain areas which you oversaturate the paint, you're going to have problems. So I try to keep my paint warm as I go and I make sure that uh, it's always a skim milk consistency. And you can see that will set up the uh, transparent brown next. And the lower part here. Okay, yeah, once again, I'm going to come in here with the tape and uh, crop uh, these leg areas here because I do want to retain uh, the uh, crisp edge and I don't want uh, flesh tone uh, powdering against this black area here. take our tape off here. Okay, now that we have our flesh tone pretty much established throughout the uh, body here, um, for the most part uh, we can come back in with the uh, transparent and uh, just kind of shade around the contours of these edges and these soft areas here. Okay, I'm going to start shading the uh, forearm here with this uh, transparent light brown. And the main thing that I want everybody to see is that I'm really doing uh, small wisps 
I say this on all my movies, I'm not crylining back and forth. And you'll start to see how I start knocking down some of this black, blending that back. I don't want to be too dependent on that black in uh, the middle areas here. There's a lot of flesh tone, there's a lot of intense transitioning, so I want to make sure that I uh, keep the black where it is and the browns where they are. In this area right here, I'm going to start sketching where I would uh, potentially lay a template or maybe uh, do some intense freehand. That just tells me where I'm going to go. I think this area, to be honest with you, is going to be more freehand as opposed to a real hard edge. You need both in composition. You need soft edges, you need hard edges. There's not that much tone up here. So I give an indication of a roll around or a contour. But paint what you see, not what you think you see. There's definitely more tone over here. And it gets really, really dark down in this area. There's an elbow indication right here. And again, it's the uh, dark brown that's really going to pop this out. There's just a big blur right here. not familiar with the term foreshortening. Foreshortening is when something kind of comes at you in 3D but it kind of dissipates or fades in the background and it looks uh, very oblong, very obtuse, and it looks very strange. But sometimes the actual photograph may look pretty silly but it is what it is. I'll bring this around a little more here. I'll intensify this elbow area a little bit more. I'll start shaping that out. Pretty harsh transition down here. This area in here is going to be kind of a high maintenance area because it's not really a stripe, it's a real soft, subtle edge. Nothing bugs me more when I see an airbrush movie uh, than when people actually start shading and they really don't kind of uh, describe how they're talking to themselves when they're doing what's called assigning value uh, to particular areas of a piece. Uh, I have a four square system. I said it in my electroskull video. You have a full tone, which is a totally dark area, a half tone, which is about half that intensity, and then when you come in areas around here, around the elbow, that's actually considered to be a quarter tone. Those are the areas that you barely see. So to a beginning portrait artist or a Anybody that's trying to learn anatomy and muscle tones, um, that's a good way to think. Uh, the fourth part of this dialogue is the voided or the white type of areas or the lighter areas, which you basically leave alone and become the highlight or the, uh, the hotter points of light when you're shaving here. Over here, I'm going to start bringing this in now from the black to the muscle tone. And the next color I'm going to sneak in here is going to be the dark brown. Okay, the dark brown is the cool part here because the dark brown actually helps us transition this a little bit better. Um, the reason why I didn't go to dark brown on top of flush tone is because it would be too extreme and too uh, powdery and ashy looking. So, 
the light brown sets it up and this is what I would call the piercing part. Knock down any overspray. So definitely you can see how this uh, starts to bring this around a little bit here. I can really emphasize underneath all this muscle mass here of her arm and accent it pretty nicely. I like the uh, Createx dark brown that they made. Um, they changed it and uh, pulverized it a little bit better. And illustrators like it, but t-shirt artists hate it because the uh, wash fastness of uh, the paint fades on t-shirts more, but it flows better and it's a lot stronger when you're doing uh, illustrating. You can see just by looking at this simple uh, three color system here, how you can pull off a pretty believable uh, flesh tone value. Uh, hopefully you can start seeing that you can do religious art or whatever. You don't need to overthink the flesh tone thing unless of course you're doing some type of uh, photorealism and you're working in a different color system. Uh, that's pretty good for this elbow type area here. I'm going to come around up in this uh, subtle area here with the dark brown but not get too carried away. Very lightly. Just trying to accent here a little bit. Back in the days, I used to just take a big French curve and just crop that out. But in this particular photo reference, um, I just want to keep this area soft. And it will please the eye to see the uh, hard edge against the soft edge here. I think around the uh, edge of the shoulder blade here, I will lightly transition that. Okay, I'm going to start blending this hand area down here. Again, a lot of the stuff is pretty vague, so once you start pushing it back, you, know, you can hide it pretty easily. Okay, with the dark brown, I'll start trimming some of this out here. I'm going to take my uh, shield and keep it lifted off the surface just to give an indication of the descending muscle there. Uh, don't forget to give your uh, body parts uh, shape and form. And we'll come in with some uh, light brown around the uh, chest here. I'm going to start a reference point of where I'm going to shade and sketch with this. I think I'll come up with a, a straight edge here, a uh, piece of x-ray film, you can use whatever you want. But I have it uh, lifted off the surface just to uh, get a little sneaky edge that will lightly separate this arm from the uh, chest area here. I don't want anything real extreme. And a lot of people again have problems with using edges and templates and so on, but uh, this pretty much proves that you can uh, Come in and soften them up as long as you keep your fingers or knuckles underneath them. Okay, this is kind of a weird pose here, but uh, believe it or not, she has her head laid back and the uh, bottom part of her clavicle, which is uh, the uh, bone near your uh, shoulder, actually extends out here and we see a little bit of an underlying shadow underneath that. There's not a lot of shading in this area, but you still want to stay true to where things are. I can do a lot of freehanding now. Even though I isolated this arm from the neck area, I can come in here and whisk a little bit of tone on the roll around part of the arm here. Don't want to leave it void, that would be pretty cheesy to do that. And I can take my template and crop this off here. As I keep saying, the dark brown is really what's going to transition this uh, the most. The light brown is to set up and reference where things are. The dark brown is to pierce. Top part of the clavicle here. And the neck muscle just kind of dissipates. I think I'm about ready for my dark brown in this area here. 
Okay, now as I take my dark brown and I'm filling this in, I am going to come in here with some shield work. This is a part of the piece where you see a pretty distinctive crisp edge here. Okay, I'm going to bring the brown in and start bringing this uh, dark area up here. And I will take my uh, template and isolate this area here. It's a pretty crisp area of the piece. And then here's the move. I'm actually going to take this and finish it off like this. So you can start an edge here, wipe the paint off, and then bend it around. As long as you don't crisscross your edges or come in and violate this portion of the arm here. And this basically sets up a lot of dark tone that's in this area. And this all gets really dark as we come back this way. And we'll keep cruising up the arm here. And when we zoom in, you can see how I start to sculpt this out here. Bottom part of the clavicle, top part of the clavicle. And I can even knuckle an edge over that bone. The neck muscle here actually starts to fade and taper. But I don't just want to make this straight. It's got a little bit of a curve to it. And I can definitely take my shield here and split the arm. depth we're starting to uh, create here. Okay, on the other arm here, I'm going to start transitioning the tones here with my light brown. Uh, start prefacing where I may use some of these shields, or I just may revert to freehanding. But this uh, is what sketching is all about. It's one of the first things that you learn when you take airbrush classes, hopefully. You have to sketch. Now again, up here I have what's called the lazy edge. A lot of people, uh, since it's so void, they will just want to come in here and attack this and darken it. But that actually is one of the things, as you can see on the other side here, that will throw the whole image off. Put a light amount of tone on there, but that's a pretty much a voided area up here. Okay, zooming in here, when you see how the uh, um, arm here starts to crease in, it's uh, pretty much a normal nature to come in and put a crease like this. But for this photo reference, that's not the case. I'm actually going to come in like this. Again, keep my fingers or knuckles underneath this and just lightly trap an edge there. It's real important that you don't reverse edges when you're shading things. You will learn different theories on how to trap edges and angle and shade with these things, but uh, it's just going to take some practice on just uh, doing random edges just to see if you're actually trapping the edge that way or you're trapping it that way. In this case, I'm trapping it this way because it shades and fades more towards that direction than it does if I hold this down like this and put tone going in that direction. Just take some practice there. So we'll continue shading this arm here. The same synopsis, I have like a full tone, a totally dark area. I'm going to transition into a half tone, which is half that intensity. And then as I blend out, I will start going into quarter tones and then again, void. Okay, in the wrist area, it's pretty much just a fade out. You don't see a lot of uh, detail over here, which is actually going to come in handy because you don't have to do as much work. I still want to stay true to where the, uh, the hand starts to angulate back, which is about right there. You'll see somewhat of a, an indention and maybe even a wrist bone. Uh, and then we're going to have hair that kind of comes through here. And then as always, the dark brown is going to help me uh, transition pretty nicely there. A lot of tone up in here by the wrist. 
I'm looking at my photo reference about every 30 seconds. The dark area around the bone of the wrist there. And then I will trap the edge of the wrist here with my shield. And again, it's off the surface. I don't want to come too far into the arm. I want to make sure I keep everything true in little islands of shading. I like the word islands. Every little um, isolated area you can think of as an island where it stops and starts. Always try to be comparative and uh, relevant. If you have an edge here, look at your photo reference and see where that edge compares to maybe where something else starts or stops. And with the dark brown, I'll get closer and do these little wisps. And even up here I can go pretty soft and then taper into this crisp edge here. Again, we call that transitioning. You transition colors, you transition edges. And we'll take the dark brown and refine these hair strands now. And at the end I'll probably come in here with a paintbrush also. Just to refine these and tighten them up a little bit. The wrist protrudes back. I need a lot of concentrated dark brown in this area to make it believable as it dissipates into the darkness. Probably take my shield and hold it right here. Also take my shield and crop this area off with the dark brown where the wrist is. Okay, I want to show you real quick how to get rid of little boo-boos here. I have a reference line that's going uh, the wrong way here. It uh, descends down when it's supposed to come over to the uh, crease of the arm here. So I'm going to show you how to do reconstructive surgery pretty quickly. Um, I don't mind when things like this happen because uh, it's actually going to help you guys when you uh, get into these types of situations here. Step one is you want to come in with some nice powdery clean white. You don't want to get too carried away with it because again white uh, does set off a blue hue. Um, I was told something really really important when I, I first started airbrushing is that if you screw up like this you have the perfect tool to fix things. That's why Cosmopolitan Magazine and all these other um, mediums use airbrush, uh, photographic restoration and so on is because you can blend things back out. So I actually like it when stuff like this happens because it will prevent you guys hopefully from uh, throwing your airbrush into a window or uh, going off or whatever. So take your white first and use thick white right out of the bottle. I actually call white a, uh, a covering agent or a, a restore or a highlighter because if it's thick like this, you can get in and out and then um, you don't have to powder out uh, the whole surface here with a, a more skim milk type mixture. So white is the first step. We're going to apply some heat here. And making sure that we have true flesh tone, we're going to come in here and do little wisps. And this will set it back up. Just don't come in here and go back and forth and kill this thing. We can even apply heat as we go here. Okay, and after that's uh, warm, you can see uh, it blends in pretty nicely. So I come back in with my light brown here. Blend all that back out. This really reinstates the whole purpose that you don't cry long when you're airbrushing. Now I can re-reference where I'm going with this edge. Again, this is going to be a softer edge here. I'm airbrushing about 53 to 55 PSI. These Aztecs work a lot better at that pressure. Now we'll zoom in a little bit here because we have to distinguish between hard edges and random soft creases here. And these creases 
right here are going to be a lot more free-handed than they are with the shields. If you're a big illustrating buff like I am, it's so easy just to come in here and start nailing uh, creases down with this shield. And you can do it lightly if you want to, but I would not get too carried away because it'll make her look like a rubber man or plastic man. Be more dependent on freehanding when you get up in these types of areas here. These are little dagger strokes. And once again, the brown is going to pop this area out here. Now, looking at my photo reference, when I'm crawling down here, these soft edges do kind of uh, taper into a harder type edge. But again, I don't want to keep it totally up against the surface. I want to lift it. And it gives me an indication that there's a stronger edge there. But don't be too dominant with that. This is where you need to be careful. Make sure you don't violate your negative space, your voided areas. And some more light brown down here. And the dark brown will come in and again kind of knuckle the shield. I'm also accenting the shadow here. Break out my straight edge again. Keep it lifted off the surface. That will help that edge there. And again, you can come in and freehand it. That just sets up the edge. You can kind of smoke that edge out now. Just kind of fade it out. Shadows are pretty extreme up here. They come out. And back here now by the back of the arm. This is all pretty dark up in here. But hopefully you're catching on. You can see that you have to have the light brown to support the dark brown. Again, it's kind of an underpainting process. Just like when we fixed this little boo-boo here. That was uh, called underpainting where I went white, then flesh tone, then brown. It's kind of the same thing here. To be able to put a real harsh color on here like this, I have to have the light brown underneath it to support and transition that color. And anywhere you need to come in with black, you can definitely do that if you want to. It's a preference. And again, if things get too smoky, because again, this dark brown is a very smoky color, you can come back in with light brown and uh, do what's called lolly popping your uh, transparent paints. Okay, I do have this uh, flush tone based here. I'm going to take my light brown and start shading this down. I don't want to kill my edge here. I want to try to retain and preserve that. I'm going this all down. This is a really dark area. And with these taped off, I can bend my tape wall up and start blending this thing out. I might even come in with a little bit of red, transparent deep red, to accent some of these dramatic areas here. A lot of brown in this area. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the light brown in that area. Uh, notice that uh, for the most part I tinted over the whole thing. This is called a tint or a wash. Uh, as opposed to if you look up in these elbow type areas, I left a lot of the uh, original base flesh tone exposed. Um, that's the uh, difference in the uh, value and intensity of the lighting that you uh, need to pay attention to. Um, and again, I'll probably come in here with some uh, deep red just to kind of warm this whole concept up here around the belly and it will actually add more drama to it. But we'll come in with the uh, dark brown next. Okay, now this thing's going to start popping out. I have a pretty intense dark edge down here. So I'm going to accent that with my dark brown. And this dark edge, it gets one of this uh, really stark, light, flesh tone edge is what's going to really bring the eye in from a distance. This would be, for the most part, my final piercing with these browns. But again, if I need to come in with black in these outskirt areas here of the side, I can definitely do that. Okay, and with the uh, Createx Transparent Red here, I'm going to lightly dust this thing. I always tell my students that your tinting distance is not uh, 6 inches back, but maybe 10 to 12 inches back. And you can certainly put a piece of contact paper on here 
and spray on the clear contact paper just to preface the intensity of the tint. And I pretty much know how uh, this is going to look, so I'll just lightly, ever so lightly, I'm at about 10 inches back now, just going to lightly dust this with red. I would actually spray the red in the darker areas here. We have a nice little contrasting value here. And as you can see in these areas here, I've got my black and I'm fading to light brown. But I want to make sure that I don't just keep this totally void of paint. I put a real light tone of the light brown on here because that's actually what I see in the picture. And that's where you really have to start training yourself to paint what you see. If something's void, leave it void, but you kind of kind of discern um, how much tone or tint is on there. And we'll uh, come in here and pierce these muscle tones out lightly. I'm staying at an angle. You can see that shape has a lot to do with this uh, overall manipulation with this concise edge. Mm -hmm. 